How to Fix Common Podcast Interview Problems. Welcome to the Audacity to Podcast, episode 277. Thank you for joining me for the Audacity to Podcast. I'm Daniel J. Lewis, and this is the award-winning in-depth podcast about podcasting. It's where I give you the guts and teach you the tools to launch or improve your own podcast for sharing your passions and finding success. By the way, did you know I still record the Audacity to Podcast live on Mondays at about 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time? Go to theaudacitytopodcast.com slash live on Mondays at that time, and you'll be able to watch live regardless of what technology I'm using. That URL, theaudacitytopodcast.com slash live, will always get you there, and I'd love to see you hanging out in the chat room while I'm recording the show live, and sometimes I stick around and chat more about podcasting or answer some podcasting questions. That's Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern at theaudacitytopodcast.com slash live. Interviews can create good content and share powerful stories, and they've been doing so for decades across all media. Interviews in podcasts are not new. They've been around since the beginning of podcasts. And interviews in audio or video are not new at all. They've been around for decades, and they continue on And many people have great success with them, not merely because it's an interview format, but because of the information that's pulled from the interview and the quality in the guest. Podcasting is full of interviews. And (laughs) let's be honest, many of those interviews have some big problems for whatever reasons. So here is how to fix these most common problems that I see with podcast interviews. I have eight problems that I'll address with you. Number one, poor audio quality. Number two, scheduling. Number three, introductions. Number four, weak questions and answers. Number five, legal issues. Number six, irrelevant value. Number seven, wasted words. And number eight, bad or no transitions. If you want to follow along in the show notes for this episode, number 277, then go to theaudacitytopodcast.com slash interview problems. The first most important thing for you to know before we talk about fixing these problems or when you're thinking about addressing these problems with your guest or trying to prevent these problems from happening in your communication with your guest ahead of time, first, respect your guest. Regardless of whom you may interview, make it easy for them. Don't give them a multi-page checklist or require them to do complicated things to be on your podcast. Remember, they are doing you a favor, and it could be a huge favor in being on your podcast. That alone is a huge favor, huge value, even if they never promote the podcast to their audience. And you shouldn't have a guest on your podcast just because you want to reach their audience. You should have a guest on your podcast because... You want the value from that guest. Whatever problems you face, remember to respect your guest, their time, and choose wisely what is really worth inconveniencing your guest in order to fix or prevent. Certain problems may just not be worth it. If you hear a dog barking in the background while your guest is talking, yes, there may be times when you say, hey, can we wait until your dog is quiet? There may be other times that you recognize this conversation is so good, it's so unrepeatable that I don't think anyone will really care that much about the dog barking in the background because this information being shared right now is that good. So I'm just going to let that go. Respect your guest. Respect their time. And choose wisely what's really worth inconveniencing in order to fix or prevent. So now let's go through these eight common podcast interview problems and how to fix them. Again, the show notes for this episode are at theaudacitytopodcast.com slash interview problems. Number one, poor audio quality. Unless you're interviewing other podcasters, it's very likely that your guest is not as passionate and knowledgeable about audio quality as you are, and that's totally okay. But before I help you understand and fix poor audio quality, you should know that What's more important than the audio quality is the content and presentation. 
far above the production quality. As long as people can hear, understand, and get value from what your guest says, your guest's audio doesn't have to be as good as yours. In fact, most people will forgive lower audio quality from your guest, but they often will expect higher audio quality from you. So if your guest is calling in through the telephone line and it's telephone quality, that's totally okay. I recommend that you, as the host of your show, have the absolute highest audio quality that's reasonable and affordable for you. But don't worry so much about that from your guest. Make sure that they can be heard, they can be understood, and that the value is being communicated. But when we are talking about audio quality, the following three things affect your guest's audio quality the most, even more than the particular technology they use in talking with you during the podcast. It's their mic technique, their environment, and your processing. First, with their mic technique, ensure your guest knows how to use a microphone. Generally, this means doing only three things. Talk into the microphone, stay a consistent distance away, which is Pretty much universally, a fist width away is pretty ideal for most people on most microphones. And the third thing is don't touch the microphone or anything connected to it as much as possible because that's what creates that annoying handling noise that can be really loud. It can be irritating to people who listen, especially if it's a headset mic and that microphone is dragging along their clothing. That can create loud scraping noises that can literally hurt people's eardrums. Thus, instead of using their computer and its built-in microphone, sometimes you may need to be a little less conventional in how you interview someone in order to get better audio quality from them and to allow them to have better mic technique. So for example, instead of using their computer and its built-in microphone, which for most people would be at least two feet away from their voice, then that gives you a lot of ambient noise, a lot of reverb, echo even, and just a really bad sound to their voice. And instead of then suggesting that they inconvenience themselves or get really uncomfortable by leaning over their microphone or anything weird like that, consider suggesting that they connect with you over their smartphone instead. Like even if you're using Skype, suggest that they install Skype on their smartphone or whatever tool that it is that you use, if there's a smartphone version for it, that might be better. Because consider this, first of all, smartphone mics are pretty good, especially when they remain a consistent and short distance from the voice. They'll sound much better than a computer's built-in microphone, and often much better than USB headsets or other kinds of headsets like that. Now think about how you hold a phone. Typically, if you're holding it to your head, You've got the earpiece up to your ear and the microphone is near your mouth about a fist width away from your mouth and thus away from your voice. That's an ideal distance. So you've got a good microphone, a good distance away from the voice and fairly consistently at that distance. That could be much better audio quality than asking them to use their built-in microphone in their computer And then you get all of those problems that come along with that. But most important is that you can hear them, you can understand them, and you can pull that value from them. Second thing is their environment. Ensure that wherever your guest is, they're recording or they're talking to you in a quiet and low reverb space. This should also be somewhere that has a good internet or cellular connection. Wired is usually the best if that's an option. If they have to call in on a telephone line, then a wired telephone line is usually better than a cell phone line, unless you are using a smart technology like FaceTime audio or Skype or something like that that's really an app and it's voice over IP. It's no longer simply a telephone line, and then their smartphone may be the best way to do that. But if they're talking through their computer, try to make sure that they are on a wired connection instead of wireless connection. More and more, that's becoming more difficult because many computers are coming out without any kind of way to hardwire into the network. But Wi-Fi networks are also getting better. However, they are still susceptible to certain interference or just ups and downs that could affect the call quality. But what's even more important than that bandwidth issue 
is that they're in an environment where it's ideal for them to record. Convince them to not be on a bus or in a mall or someplace public that's loud and has really bad echo and reverb from other sounds as well as potentially their own voice. You may even tell them, hey, call me on your smartphone through Skype while you're in your bedroom because that will have low reverb. It will be away from the rest of the house. So if there are any kitchen noises or kids or anything like that, that might be a lot quieter. Then again, maybe going outside would be quieter for them. It's really about what's easy for them and produces good results without being too much of an inconvenience. The third thing you may need to do to get good audio quality from your guest is use some processing. Now, this is on you. This is not at all on your guest. Regardless of the technology you use to communicate with your guest and record the audio from your guest, you will probably need a little audio processing afterward. Usually this may be only one or two things. That would be loudness normalization to get your guest volume level to match your volume level and ensure that both your volume levels are at the ideal target loudness level of negative 16 LUFs for stereo or negative 19 LUFs for mono. And you can use tools like Aphonic, Adobe Audition, and there are even workflows that allow you to do this with Audacity and other software. And I've got a tutorial for that inside of Podcaster Society. But that loudness normalization will ensure that people don't have to adjust their volume as they hear you talk. You're really loud, and then your guest is really quiet. And then you're really loud, and your guest is really quiet. Your audience won't have to adjust the volume level back and forth to try to listen to that and understand that. The volume level is what affects someone's ability to be able to hear that person very well compared to your voice. So regardless of how they're talking to you, make sure their volume level is the same as yours. This may not necessarily look like the audio waveforms are the same thickness as yours, depending on the technology that you're using. So don't do this based on sight. Do it based on sound and analysis through those tools that measure with standard loudness normalization protocols and give you that LUFS value or something similar to that. The other thing that you may need is compression. The purpose of compression is really to reduce the difference between those loud and those quiet spots. Commonly, we are louder at the beginning of our words, as well as louder at the beginning of our sentences. We tend to trail off at the ends of our words and at the ends of our sentences. Not everyone does this. Some people are really good at staying at a consistent volume level through every word and through their entire paragraph and sentence and conversation. But most people do drift off a little bit. And there are always those little circumstances where maybe they got a little bit farther away from their microphone, turned away a little bit, something distracted them, their volume level goes down, or they get really excited about something. And for most people, when we get excited, our volume level goes up. So adding some compression can help reduce that difference. Make sure that you do your compression before you do loudness normalization because compression will reduce volume levels. Some compression plugins will then increase the volume level after compressing it, but still make sure you do your loudness analysis and correction after you do the compression so that you get a good, consistent result. If you need more help for that, join Podcaster Society and look for the Universal Loudness Normalization Workflow video tutorial that's in there. Some other things that you may need to consider is if your guest is more tech savvy or willing to try better things, you could use more advanced call recording solutions such as Cast, Zencaster, Ringer, and other tools like that. Each of these tools have their own strengths and weaknesses that I won't get into here because they could change at a moment's notice. But one tool may be better on mobile. Another tool may be better on desktop. Another tool may be better for multiple people, while another tool is better for only two people. You need to discover what tool works best for you and makes it easy for your guest. In some circumstances, you may even be able to ask your guest, would you record your side of the audio and send that to me? That's what I do whenever someone interviews me in a podcast. I always record 
my side as well as their side, but in separate audio tracks so that they get a nice high quality recording from me. If they record where their voice is separate from my voice, then they always have the option of using my audio track that I provide them to get a much higher quality audio recording. And that can also eliminate the problems that you might face with bandwidth where the voice degrades momentarily while bandwidth issues are adjusted. You may not want to do this though with your guests because it might be too complicated, too much of an inconvenience. Focus on those things that make it simple and so that you can do what you really need to do with this guest and that is have that conversation and pull out that value. Those are some ways to fix the common podcast interview problem of poor audio quality, mic technique, environment, and processing. Number two, scheduling. Getting availabilities to align can be almost as hard as aligning the planets, but here are some general tips for fixing scheduling problems. First, suggest specific times. Even if you have a scheduling system, it may be most convenient for your guest if you simply suggest a couple specific times that you know will work, or your guest may suggest specific times for you. Work with them, but be specific. Don't simply say, hey, just pick it any time in the future, let me know, and then you can end up with that back and forth sort of thing. If you don't use a scheduling system or maybe you decide for this particular guest, it's best if you simply suggest a couple specific times, do that. Make it simple. Make it easy for them. Also, always use time zones. Your guest may be anywhere in the world, so always ensure you're talking about the same time. If you know their location, it may be best to speak according to their time zone, and that's pretty nice because then they don't have to convert to their time zone, but still include the time zone in case they're traveling. You could be talking to someone who's normally in California, but they're now in New York, and that's three hours different, so make sure you specify that you're talking in Pacific time or Eastern time. And here's a side note and a little pet peeve I have. American time zone abbreviations change with daylight saving time, and so do the GMT or UTC offsets. So make sure you're either using the correct abbreviation, such as EDT, which stands for Eastern Daylight Time, versus EST, which stands for Eastern Standard Time, or keep it universal, such as simply writing ET or Eastern Time, or maybe you even say Chicago Time or New York Time or... Dallas time or whatever it is, something like that. Be very clear. I've run into this before and I've seen it happen with other people where a time was agreed on and back and forth. But then at some point, someone didn't recognize what the time zone was and they showed up an hour early, an hour late. Some kind of confusion happened and it broke down. Always use time zones. Also, prioritize your guest's schedule. Unless you're famous, Be flexible to accommodate your guest instead of forcing them to fit your schedule, especially for really important guests. I've interviewed celebrities before who have been on TV and the day before their interview, they've a couple times this has happened where they've said, sorry, something came up. We need to reschedule. I didn't say, oh, sorry, I can't do it then if we reschedule or anything like that. I made myself flexible for them. And it was more important to have them on the podcast than for it to be at the perfect time for me. Now, there are those times where maybe you have an extremely popular podcast, like look at John Lee Dumas's EO Fire podcast, and he records all of his interviews on a particular day. Now, in a way, he is famous with that podcast and people are asking to be on his podcast. He doesn't have to go out anymore and try to find guests. So it's more reasonable for him to expect people to conform to his schedule than for him to conform to their schedule. But if John Lee Dumas were to have the opportunity to interview the president of the United States, I'm sure he would be willing to accommodate the president's schedule instead of forcing the president to accommodate John's schedule. And the next tip here for scheduling is use a scheduling system. If you can't suggest specific times or maybe that gets a bit too complicated, you need a template for whatever reasons, often a scheduling system can help you avoid that back and forth 
and thus overwhelm your guest and decrease the chances of their being able to be on your podcast. Use a tool like a pointlet, schedule once, Calendly, Acuity. There are many other tools like that. And find the one that works for you that's affordable, that has the features you need. And most importantly, that makes it as easy as possible for your guest to pick a time that works for both of you. Remember, it needs to be easy and simple. Don't make this an extremely long form that they have to fill out. Don't force them to create an account to use your scheduling system. Don't make them have to try and do the math in their head for the time zone that the form is on. Make it easy and simple. And that's what many of these online scheduling tools can do for you and for your guest. This is number two, scheduling. Suggest specific times, always use time zones, prioritize your guest schedule, and use a scheduling system. Number three, introductions. I'm going to be controversial here. Quote, tell me about yourself, unquote. Communicates one unfortunate thing about you. That is, you're lazy. I know that probably hurts a little, but hear me out. As an interviewer, a guest, and a listener myself, I think it shows far more respect and communicates more relevance when you are the one who introduces your guest, and you do so without merely reading their bio. I've been a guest on many other podcasts, and when they read my bio, I hear them stumble over things here or there, or I hear them not quite read it in the most clear way, and I'd much rather that they introduce me. What do they know about me? What do they appreciate about me? When I had the opportunity to interview Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl, for the first webinar for Podcaster Society, that was back in September 2015, and that webinar is available only to members of Podcaster Society. But in that introduction, I said all kinds of nice things about her. I praised her. I explained who she is, why I appreciated and respected her. I kind of talked about how I got to know her and how I first discovered her podcast. I was much more enthusiastic with that introduction, and it was much more relevant to my audience. And then when she got to respond, I think the first thing she said was, wow, thank you very much. And she was honored by that introduction. When people merely read my bio as a means to introduce me in their podcast, I don't really feel honored by that. When people ask me to introduce myself, I'll be transparent here and tell you, I feel like it's an unnecessary question. Like it's a question that they should have answered themselves and something that is kind of wasting our time as part of the interview because they need to make me relevant to their audience. And as a listener to podcasts that may interview other people or may have a guest for whatever reason, I like it so much more when I hear the host do their own introduction as the guest. And there are many different ways that you could do that introduction. I won't get into that here. But the most important thing is to make that guest relevant to your audience. You don't have to mention every single accolade they have or every single accomplishment. Mention what's relevant. Mention why they are in this podcast. Why should your audience care about this person? And then your interview can go a whole lot nicer. This does mean that you need to do at least a little research on your guest. The better you know them, the better you can introduce them. Another common problem I hear in podcast interviews is a double introduction. The host will often pre-record the interview with an introduction in it there with the guest. And then when they record their regular episode, they record an opening to that interview. And in that opening, they introduce the guest there too. So what ends up happening is you hear the podcast start. The host says, I'm really happy to share this interview with you with so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so is such and such and they've accomplished this. I think you'll like this about them and that kind of thing. And then they go into the interview and then inside the interview, they say, I'm welcoming so-and-so to my podcast here. So-and-so is such and such and they've done this. They do the same thing over again. 
that's completely unnecessary. It's wasting your audience's time and it may even be wasting the time of your guest. So consider whether what you're saying leading into the interview is redundant with the interview's opening itself. Sometimes this may mean removing whatever introduction you record into the interview or whatever introduction you record into the opening of your podcast. Do what fits and flows and respects your guest and communicates their relevance to your audience. That's number three, introductions. Number four, Weak questions and answers. The burden of a quality interview rests on you, not on your guest. Gary Vaynerchuk is highly respected in the social media space, and he has all kinds of amazing insight and value to give. And I recently heard an interview with Gary Vaynerchuk, and I was excited to hear this interview. The interviewer was someone else I've heard great things about, but... The interview was horrible. It was an absolute, what we call a train wreck. And it wasn't Gary Vaynerchuk's fault because he does have amazing insight and value to give, but it was the interviewer's fault. The interviewer was asking really weak questions and getting weak answers, or the interviewer would go on and on for a couple minutes building up to some kind of question or asking all of these things or the questions the interviewer was asking seemed completely unnecessary. Like what value is there going to be in the answer to that question? Is this a, hey, I just want to get to know you kind of interview? Or is this a, let's bring some value to the audience kind of interview? So some ways that you can work around that are research your guest and their industry Ask questions you know your guest will be good at answering. You may get ideas based on other interviews or things they've been doing lately. Those ideas could be questions to ask, questions to avoid, or quality questions no one else has asked them. And think about what your audience would want to know about that guest, as well as their relation to the industry and what kind of information you can pull from them. Avoid questions that lead to simple yes or no answers. Often, questions that start with words like does, did, and are are usually signs of a yes or no question. And it's <laughs> many people will not answer simply yes or no, but to get good content from them means they have to work harder to answer that question to give value because you kind of robbed them of the opportunity to give value by simply asking a yes or no question, or maybe the question you're asking them is completely unnecessary. It's like if you had me on your podcast and you ask the question, has your wife supported what you're doing in podcasting? I could simply answer the question to say, yes. Okay, next question. Have you enjoyed podcasting? Yes. Okay, next question. You see, it now most likely your guest won't be like that, but it takes extra work to go beyond that yes or no. There are those times where a yes or no question is appropriate, but don't make them the main questions you ask. To do that, make your questions open-ended questions. Instead of saying, did this or does that or are you... Ask bigger things like, what do you think about? Or what was something that inspired you? Or who inspired you? Or different things like that. Instead of saying, was your wife an inspiration in your doing this? Or anything like that. Think about that common thing, who, what, when, where, how, and why. Those are better open-ended questions. Who inspired you? What did you do here? When Did you learn this or anything like that? Try and let them fill in the details. And that goes into the next point. Don't try to be the expert with your questions. Let your guest be the expert. Let them fill in all of those details, especially if you know the answers already. You don't have to communicate that you know something in the way that you ask the question. Simply ask the question. One of the ways I commonly hear people do this is by 
providing possible answers to the question. And it's often a yes or no question. And then they provide answers to the question. And that just starts wasting words. It doesn't let the guest become the expert in that topic. Next, don't force your outline. Some questions may be irrelevant to your guest, especially if you follow the same outline episode after episode after episode. That can work for some people, and it can work really well for some people, but it may not work very well for other people. And also, skip those questions that they may have already answered. I've heard this before. There was a podcast I was once really excited about, and I listened to, and I loved the idea of the podcast. I was liking the conversations But the presentation style was starting to really bother me because the host would have their outline of questions that they would ask. And sometimes the guest, and this has even happened to me when I've been a guest on other people's podcasts, sometimes the guest will answer multiple questions in their response to a single question. But then the host, focusing on their outline, asks that question again And then what's the guest to do? Does the guest then say, well, like I said earlier, or does the guest answer shortly, or does the guest skip that? You create an awkward situation and a situation where you're not providing extra value. The guest may have already addressed that. Don't force your outline. Be flexible with the outline. Recognize when you might need to skip certain questions, especially in respect of the guest's time. You may get only one question out there and the guest runs with that and you have a great conversation for half an hour and then you're out of time. That's fine. Don't worry about the lightning round. Don't worry about the success quote, their favorite books or whatever other questions you'd like to ask all of your other guests. Focus on having that quality conversation to bring value to your audience. And my last tip here in this point is listen. This was Mark Marin's single word advice from Podcast Movement 2015. Listen to everything your guest says and communicates through their emotions, and you may discover more value than you ever anticipated. When you listen to your guest, to everything they're sharing with you, you can come up with follow-up questions. You can recognize when they've answered a question that you, you were planning to ask. You can discover new directions to take the conversation. You can pull out better value only when you listen, truly listen to what they're saying and not focus on the format of your podcast so much, but you focus on the conversation you're having. Unless your guest is an expert interviewee and decides to work harder than you in the interview, the general rule is Bad questions lead to bad answers. So don't ask bad questions and don't make your guest work harder than you are for your podcast. That's number four problem, weak questions and answers. Number five common podcast interview problem, legal issues. How are you protecting yourself and your podcast if your guest doesn't like their interview or you don't use their interview or some other issues come up? You really should have a legal release form. Your guest signs, not only records a verbal acceptance, but they sign it and they return it to you before you record. This should not be a really long form that they have to have their lawyer read over too. This can be something really short and it really needs to cover some important basic things. For example, compensation. Will they get paid? What if you later charge for this episode or you make a product from this episode? What kind of compensation can they expect? Or are they saying that they forfeit the right to earn any compensation from the content they share in your podcast and you have full right to monetize it and get compensated for it in whatever way that you deem necessary? It could be very easy for a guest for your podcast to hear that, oh, you had a sponsor for that episode. I should get a cut of that and go back to you and say, it sounds like you're making this much per episode. So I demand that you pay me this much for the episode that you had sponsored. Yikes, what do you do? You need to prevent that kind of thing by addressing these legal issues really before they become an issue. The other thing your release forms need to cover is, well, 
obviously, some kind of release. What are your guests letting you do with their recording, their imagery, and the content that they share in your podcast? Do they have any kinds of rights over the episode, or are they releasing those rights to you? There are many other legal issues about podcast interviews that you need to consider. In fact, there are really big legal issues all around podcasting, and that's why I'm thrilled to have entertainment lawyer Gordon Firemark as my guest in a free webinar on Thursday, August 25th at 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. That's GMT minus four. We're going to discuss copyrights, trademarks, releases, contracts, and much more. Like, can you use a clip from a movie inside of your podcast? How can you protect yourself if you do interviews? What kinds of release forms do you need to have for your guests or for your co-hosts? What kinds of contracts should you have? What should you be aware of if you're joining a podcast network and many other things like that? This is going to be a completely free webinar. Register over at podcasterssociety.com or I have the link to it in the show notes for this episode at theaudacitytopodcast.com slash interview problems. There will be a free replay available for a limited time afterward. So make sure you register for the webinar, even if you can't make it when the webinar is live. But I really think you'll love it if you make it live because you can ask your questions and get some specific answers. And we'll be sure to make time for that in that webinar. So that will be on Thursday, August 25th at 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time or GMT minus 4. Now, after a couple days, that replay will no longer be available to the public, but it will be exclusively available then to members of Podcaster Society for their entire membership. So if you want to make sure that you can watch that webinar, and you may be listening to this long after August 25th, and the event has already passed, join Podcaster Society, and you can get immediate access to that webinar. Register for that webinar and learn more about Podcaster Society at Podcaster Society. That's number five, legal issues. Number six, irrelevant value. People live interesting lives, and you may bring some of that out in your podcast, but does that really matter to your audience? If you're going to get off topic or spend too much time getting to know your guest, I suggest that you move that to the end of the interview, even if that's through editing or save it for some kind of opt-in bonus that your audience can get. Regardless of the value of that content, does it matter really to your audience? And I'm not saying that that content has no value whatsoever. It could be even more valuable than the interview itself. But is that value relevant to your audience? Is that value fulfilling those expectations that you set up for the kinds of conversations and content that you bring in your podcast? Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. That's up to you to decide. So you need to focus on that relevant value and try to remove that irrelevant value. Or if there is that irrelevant value, which is still valuable, but it's maybe irrelevant to your audience, put that near the end of your podcast. When I listen to interviews of certain people, I'll be honest here, I don't really care that much about the person, at least not at first. I'm more interested in the content. I don't want to hear how they got started in their business or how they grew up. I want to hear how did they solve that problem? What that whole purpose of this episode is talking about that problem. I want to hear how did they solve that problem after I've been hooked with that content, then I'm more interested in the person. And it works that way for many of your listeners too. They're more interested in the content than the person. There are the rare cases where it's the other way around, where your audience will listen to anything your guest says, especially if your guest is some kind of celebrity or genius. They might just want to soak up every single word out of their mouths. But that could be rare in podcasting. So avoid that irrelevant value in your podcast. That's number six. Number seven, wasted words. Remember that generally bad questions lead to bad answers, but even good questions may return wasted words from your guest. Wasted words could be on your guest part as they're forming their answer in their mind. You ask a question and they say, oh, that's a really good question. Right there, wasted words. It's really unnecessary for them to say that's a good question. In fact, most likely any kind of thing that they say about your question could be wasted words. 
many of us waste words and we don't realize it. That's not to say there someone is a lower intelligence or anything like that. But if you edit that stuff out or if you try to avoid it, your guest can sound a lot more intelligent and they then may be much more excited to share that episode because they realize, wow, that interviewer made me sound amazing. And then they are ambassadors for your podcast. They may also be wasted words because they're giving a verbose answer to a simple question. One of your yes or no questions, you ask a question, they say yes, and then they start on with many more words, basically reiterating that answer, yes. You, as the podcast host and the interviewer, could also be wasting words by asking unnecessarily complex questions or giving possible answers inside of your questions. And I can tend to do this in conversations with people and in interviews as well, and I've heard it many other people do this. For example, someone might ask me, what's the best way to grow your podcast? Is it using Facebook? Is it using Twitter? Is it using an email list? Is it getting other guests on your podcast? You see what they did? They provided answers for me. And my answer in my mind may be completely different from those provided answers, So then how do I say no to all of their provided answers without making it sound like they're idiots and don't know what they're talking about? I'm not saying that they are, but that's what your audience might subtly feel from that conversation. They're wasted words. Try to avoid those or edit those out. Many of these things you may not notice until you listen back to the recording And then you realize these are certain things that can be edited out. As I shared in my past episode about faster podcast editing, those transition points are usually where there will be things that need to be edited out as well as wasted words when you're transitioning from one topic to another or when you're transitioning from one person to another, you ask a question and then your guest Responds, but their first part of their response is really wasting time, wasting words as they come up with their actual answer. Edit that stuff out. Avoid those wasted words. That's number seven. And speaking of transitions, number eight, bad or no transitions. An outline is great for keeping structure to your content, but don't be so rigid with that outline that you have bad transitions or no transitions whatsoever inside of your podcast episodes. For example, a guest could end their response with something like, and that's when I discovered I have cancer and only three months left to live. And then you, focused on your outline, say, great, how did you grow your business? Whoa, hold on. (laughs) Do you see what happened? If you were that guest, and that's what I did to you in an interview, how would you feel? You just laid out this very vulnerable thing shared this emotional, painful thing with me. And I just jump on to the next point. Even if I don't say great or awesome, which many people do by habit in response to an answer they hear. But if I just move on and gloss over that, ouch. Husbands, imagine if you did that when your wives are very vulnerable with you about something they're struggling with. Okay, let's be honest. As husbands, We've done this and we continuously struggle with this, glossing over, invalidating the feelings of our wives, or I like to say wives, because otherwise if I say our wives, it sounds like we each have multiple wives, but you know what I mean. Don't do that with your guest. Listen to them. This goes back to that advice from Mark Marin. Listen to what your guest says more than focusing on your outline. Listen for follow-up questions. Listen for those potential transitions. Eric K. Johnson from PodcastTalentCoach.com often points out that no one says, and now it's time for, in regular conversations. So why should you bring that into your podcast if you want your podcast to sound natural to say, and now it's time for this question. And now it's time to ask you about this. And now it's time to talk about that. We don't do that in real conversations. Try to avoid that in your podcast as well. And transitioning well is a skill that takes practice. So practice. Look, listen, 
Discover what you do well and what you do poorly and work on those things to get better. That's number eight, bad or no transitions. Again, these eight common podcast interview problems are number one, poor audio quality, number two, scheduling, number three, introductions, number four, weak questions and answers, number five, legal issues, number six, irrelevant value, number seven, wasted words, and number eight, bad or no transitions. I know I didn't cover every single potential problem that you could have in podcasting, and that's where I'd love for you to comment on the show notes for episode 277 at theaudacitytopodcast.com slash interview problems. Especially, I would love to hear from you. What are certain interview problems you faced and how did you fix them? So comment there at theaudacitytopodcast.com slash interview problems. That's also where you can go to get the links and other resources that I mentioned in this episode. Special thanks to Zach from hearspurgeon.com, and he's 1Peter224 on iTunes, who left a kind review for the Audacity to Podcast in iTunes. And Zach said, favorite podcast about podcasting. I listened to a handful of podcasting podcasts when I was starting up my own podcast a few months ago. Daniels is the only one I still listen to regularly. He provides the most value per minute with clear, easy to understand, thoughtfully laid out content. He also talks just enough about his own life and beliefs that I feel I can get to know the man behind the mic, which I rather enjoy. Thank you, Daniel, for holding this toddler podcaster's hand and teaching me the ropes. You're very welcome, Zach. Thank you very much for that kind review. And check out Zach over at Hear Spurgeon. Dot com. I have that link in the show notes. If you want your podcast reviews emailed to you automatically, just like I get mine emailed to me automatically from all 155 iTunes stores, plus Stitcher, plus soon Pod Directory and Google Play Music and other podcast apps and directories that offer reviews for podcasts, then sign up for an account at mypodcastreviews.com. It starts at $5 a month for a premium plan, or you can save more by signing up for an annual plan. That's at mypodcastreviews.com, and the link is in the show notes. Two announcements to share with you before I go. First, register for that free podcasting copyrights and the law webinar with Gordon Firemark at 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, GMT-4, on Thursday, August 25th, 2016. I'm really looking forward to this webinar. Gordon Firemark and I have been friends for years. We've recorded episodes in the past. We've done things together. He's been a member of Podcaster Society before. We've had all kinds of great conversations. He uses certain of my mistakes as examples in his presentations, and I have given him the release and rights to do so. And he's helped me in many other ways too. And he has so much information that you need to know about the law in regards to your podcast. And this will be somewhat US-based, but when you follow the laws of one country, it's very likely that you could then be also following the laws of another country. It's best to always try to be above the line and keep your podcast as legal as possible and protect yourself from legal issues that could arise. So register for that webinar that will be on Thursday, August 25th, 2016 at 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, GMT-4, by going to podcastersociety.com. That webinar replay will be available for a very short time after the live webinar, and then after that, it becomes exclusive to members of Podcaster Society. That's the next thing I want to tell you about, podcastersociety.com. That's the place to go to, to learn how to improve and grow your podcast. We have weekly webinars, like the one with Gordon Firemark is going to be one of our weekly webinars. We have expert support, podcast evaluations, exclusive discounts, a friendly and mature podcasting community, and more. In fact, if you want the opportunity to work with me or get some of my help, personal help, with your podcast, this is now the only way that I'm offering it, is to members of Podcaster Society. So go to podcasterssociety.com to register for that webinar and join Podcaster Society to learn how to improve and grow your podcast from average to amazing. When you join, you then get instant access to all of our past webinars where we've talked about using Instagram for growing your podcast or monetizing your podcast or we had a great conversation with Mignon Fogarty about how she grew Grammar Girl Podcast into the huge success that it is today and all kinds of great value from that conversation. We've also talked about getting your first email campaign up 
been going. We've talked about competition. We've talked about better preparation for your podcast. And inside of Podcaster Society is an exclusive course that teaches you how to improve your podcast in each of those five cornerstones. How do you improve your content? How do you improve your presentation? How do you improve your production? How do you improve your promotion? And how do you improve your profit with your podcast? That's all at podcasterssociety.com. I'd love to see you in there as a member of Podcaster Society and getting access to all of that cool, exclusive content. In fact, just recently, uh, one of the members of Podcaster Society said, I've only been a member of Podcaster Society for a short time, but I have to say I really enjoyed the experience thus far. From the assistance so many have been willing to give to the weekly digest to the learning more about this artistic medium, it's been a pleasure. So join Podcaster Society to grow your podcast from average to amazing. That's at podcasterssociety.com. Even if you can't join Podcaster Society, go to podcastersociety.com to register for that free webinar that will be on Thursday, August 25th with Gordon Firemark, where we will be talking about podcasting and the law and answering your questions. That's at podcastersociety.com. All of this information, the links and resources that I've shared with you are in the show notes for this episode at the audacity slash interview problems. And please remember to comment there with your stories of problems you've faced with podcast interviews and how you fixed them. That's at the audacity slash interview problems. Please join me on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern time at the audacity to slash live when I record this podcast live and then hang out with the audience after. And it's a lot of fun. That's 2 p.m. Eastern time on Mondays at the audacity to slash live. Now that I've given you some of the guts and taught you some of the tools, it's time for you to go launch or improve your own podcast for sharing your passions and finding success. I'm Daniel J. Lewis from the audacity to podcast.com and the Daniel J. Lewis on Twitter. Thanks for listening. The Audacity to Podcast is a proud member of Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our award-winning and award-nominated podcasts to make you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx. Big congratulations, by the way, to The Productive Woman at theproductivewoman.com and Laura McClellan, the host, for recently reaching 100 episodes. It's a great